fight. Will you fight or will you pout? Will you take what you want? Will you force that coach to play you more? I love the Muhammad Ali picture behind you. That's amazing. The uh, the one on the top uh, is his favorite picture. Was his favorite picture, according to his wife Lonnie. The one on the bottom was in Life magazine. Yeah, yeah, the boxing underwater one. I love that. Which was all fake. He couldn't like he told everybody I I train underwater. That's how I get my quickness. And Randy right, can't swim. <laughs> so if you look at that picture, he had to go in the shallow end and put his head under the water so that he could come up. Because if it was in anything over his head, he can't swim. Crazy. See, that, uh, he, he was a master, I think, like you, of marketing and getting inside people's heads a little bit. I don't know if I get inside people's head. I don't know if I market. I just uh, try to see where trends are going and you just try to stay on top so you're there. What's next, and how can I be first at it? Yes, yes, which is uh, true in sports and, and business, I think, and life. I would say. Well, to, to start, I wanted to start with uh, someone that we both share a lot of love for, uh, the godfather, uh, Coach Ravling. How do you know Coach Rav? I met him through Shaka Smart. Uh, he had me out uh, when he was at Texas and Rav was visiting him and I got to see him. And then uh, we've been in touch ever since. I, I, I try to talk to him every couple of weeks. He's like one of my favorite people in, in the whole he's, world. He's got like three books going at one time, always. Yeah. He's sending me stuff daily, um, calls me uh, to congrats, calls me to pick me up. Um he is truly a mentor. You know, you go through this thing that I go through, and only someone that has sat in this seat, when you start talking about what you're going through, they know. Um, you know, other people that, you know, hey, I just want you to hear me out. You're like, what do you do for a living? Like, why would Nick Saban or I or anybody else tell me what? And so with him, when he speaks, oh, I listen. When he talks to me about, you know, you know, let's talk through this stuff. You know, it's, you know, I leave with a great feeling because he always say, how do I help you? That's all. He, he's one of those kind of guys. How did you meet him? Um, my player in 1992 from UMass played on the USA team that he coached, the 19 and unders. Yeah. And I met him there. And when he was. When he was out of coaching, I flew him to UMass to talk to our staff. And it was the most incredible. He gave us one thing that I've used since then. You have to be each other's PR machine. You're his PR machine and him and him, and you are his PR machine, and you guys are his P Anybody that talks to you, you're their PR machine. Think about that just what that does for your staff. So he means sort of rooting and supporting and putting the best face forward for everyone as part of the organization. People are going to ask you about the guy. You're, you're ready and loaded, man. He's unbelievable. And here's why you talk about his strengths. You, uh, when everybody knows when you're more for the other guy than yourself and everybody's in that mode, you're not like, what's the next job or I want to be this title. When you're all for each other, this thing rolls. And in most cases, most, that's been my staff's. And if, if it hadn't been my staff, I'd have to shake it up a little bit. Never really fired anybody in all my years, but I've helped guys get jobs. Like, sure. it's, you know, it's, it's time. Yeah, he, he, I've been amazed at the different coaches that I've talked to to which he has uh, been a mentor of, of all different levels. He seems to be – the guy behind so many different guys. And, and I, I don't mean that in the gendered sense. There's plenty of women who he's mentored as well. He, he just seems to have this remarkable, like his coaching tree is the best coaching tree in like the history of sports, I feel like. Well, he, he would hire Division II coaches 
said, this guy's a really good coach. I want him around me. He was always comfortable as a coach in his own skin and what he did, and he wanted help. I'm only going to be, you know, I and, and I think he was one of the first that would say, I hired people who were better in areas than I was. If I were weak in an area, I would bring in a coach that was really strong in that area. Think about how much you have self-esteem and self-confidence you have to have to be that guy. And I've tried to live by that. You know, I surround myself there. I got a lot of coaches, but I surround myself with people who are strong in areas that maybe I'm not so strong. My mic calls me the idea man. And then everybody around me has to go do the, figure out the ideas that I come up with. Sure. And, and don't you think even that, that at this point in your career, that there are people that you are turning to for advice or mentorship is itself probably a good lesson for athletes and young people. I think I've always been impressed with the way that people who are the best in the world at what they do have someone that they are looking up to that is better than them at something. And they're still like a student of that person. So Larry Brown, if you want to know like a kitchen cabinet for me, yeah, Larry Brown, we'll talk once a week. Um, he brought me on at Kansas. Um, I worked for him for a couple years. And then when I was fired by the Nets, he brought me down as an assistant in Philadelphia to have me with him again and give me a start in my career again. Uh, Bob Rotella, sports psychologist, unbelievable. He's been a 30-year friend of mine um, and, a, and a confidant and a mentor. Um, he and I talk once every week or two. Um, in the season, it's more. And then Ken Blanchard, who you would probably say, what? And Ken Blanchard and I have known each other since my UMass days. And your kitchen cabinet kind of changes over time. Sure. But those guys that I just mentioned have always been catalysts, along with Coach, that I would say, here are the guys that when I'm up against it, you know, and, and there are always coaches that through the year, Mark Few and I have become great friends. Jay Wright and I, Tom Izzo and I talk all the time. You know, it's the, the day when, like Rick Barnes and I are dear friends. I'm the one that told him you need to take the Tennessee job. I didn't think he was going to beat me as much as he has, but I wanted him to take the job because I thought it was a great job for him, and I was right. He and I play. I want to beat him. He wants to beat me. But when it's over, we've been friends for 35 years. There's not much of that anymore. Ryan, it's, you know, let's, let's meet, you know, let's go. It's just not much of that. And that's why I like to be able to have guys that I know I can call that'll pick up a phone that we can talk. Some of it's laugh. Like we're both buying. We just need to laugh. And I get off the phone feeling better about what I'm doing. Epictetus said that philosophy wasn't this dry, abstract thing. It was a thing he said you should be talking about, writing down, reading about, exploring with other people all the time. He said constantly have it at hand. That's how I think about philosophy. And it's weird. For the last five years, every single day, I've been writing this free email about Stoic philosophy. It's been not just cool to meet all these fellow practitioners of Stoic philosophy, but in writing about it, talking about it, reading it for our podcast, I have got to internalize these ideas in a way that I never would have been able to under any other circumstances. That's the idea. Philosophy is something we're supposed to engage in, not keep in these dusty old books or read once and be done with. It's a constant process. And I think that's why the email has worked so well for the people reading about it and sharing it and talking about it all of that as well. So I'd love to have you join us on this email. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash daily email. It's totally free, no spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I've basically given away a book for free every single year for five years, and I'm gonna keep on doing it until I drop dead. Check it out, dailystoic.com slash daily email. Yeah, do you find that that's something you can look, you can identify in a player, like uh, that sort of hunger to get advice or to learn or... I, I'm just curious, like, how do you look for someone who is, sh uh, what are the signs in a young person that they're going to be the type of person that sort of sees this as 
an unending journey that you're always looking to get better, that you can learn from anyone. Is that something you can spot or is it something that emerges over time? The best players that I've coached are all curious. Yeah. They just have curious minds. Uh, they want to watch. They want to learn. They want to get better. Um, guys that are a little bit delusional, which means if you just play me more, I'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. You, you're not going to get drafted. You're not going to be that guy. You, if you have to have all promises, it's going to be hard for you to make it. And what we try to do here is you tell them, somebody said to me, Cal, I got to ask you, because I just got a full roster and there, I got a bunch of good guys. Could you tell me if you don't mind how you do it? I said, well, it starts, you better not have lied. If you lied to anybody and you told every one of them the same thing, yeah. that they're all going to be this guy, you're not going to be able to coach him because the minute they know you lied, there's no trust. And in what we do with really good players, the minute you lose trust, you got you can't coach. They got to know you really care about them and that you're honest, and then you can coach. But that the first piece of that is, is this guy a man of his word? Will he do what he says he's going to do? Sure. Um, the other piece of it is, Will you fight for what you want? Because, well, we're going to run every play for you, and you're going to be in this. You'll be the center of attention. All right. Okay. Now you go to the Lakers. I hate to tell you, you're not going to be the center of attention. They're not running plays for you. There are three other guys in front of you. As a matter of fact, there's probably seven, and that means you're fighting for scraps. Fighting for scraps. Fight! Will you fight or will you pout? Will you take what you want? Will you force that coach to play you more? Well, he just just played me more. Not doing that. No. You force him to play you more by how you perform. How do you play with confidence? I heard all this, you know, you got to be confident. Play co- If you're competent, you could be confident. Sure. Not guaranteed, but if you're not competent, you're not going to be confident. It don't matter if I say, you're okay. No, coach, I just missed seven straight wide. I missed two layups. You're good. That had nothing to do with me. If you get in the gym and work and build your own confidence and self-esteem, no one takes that away. When you're here at Kentucky, you learn to fight. I hear all the stuff. Well, they're pros before they got there. You Tyler Hero? Did you ever even hear of him or Eric Bledsoe? You want me to go on? I can name 20. Not true. What they learn here is not that I have a magic wand, you're a pro. It's the process. It's the culture. It's the demands, the standards you're held to. And John Wall would say it. He never promised me anything. Anthony Davis said it. He said it would be the hardest thing I'd ever do. And I, I wanted that chat. I mean – a guy that needs guarantees, you ready? Ryan, they don't come here. Uh, you're going to get 25 shots. You're going to, it's just, it's a different animal here. There's a, a line from the, the Stoic Epictetus that I think connects to what you're saying. I'd be curious your thoughts on it. He says, it's impossible to learn that which you think you already know. So if you come into it, assuming that you know everything, that all you need to be do, given is your playing time and you'll succeed, You can't get better. You can't adjust. You can't fight because you think you already earned it. And you're just going to be resentful that you're not being handed it. I I need you to do that again. And I need that taped so I can play it to my team. (laughs) Or you want to come in and be paid to do that speech. I get that, too. I would love to come give that speech. (laughs) I mean, I I think that's, you know, we think confidence is important. That's the essence of what, what it is here. Could you see why kids don't want to come here? <laughs> Could you see? I mean, serious. Of yeah, of course. If, if, if you don't want to be challenged, you're not going to go to a place that challenges you. All right, you ready? My job is to make them uncomfortable. Their job is to be comfortable, being uncomfortable, and when you hit that, you're gone. I don't want to be uncomfortable, though. I want to go and be comfortable playing. It's hard. 
my staff says, you got to stop. We've lost recruits because of that. And I said, <laughs> you know what? I've done this a long time the same way. And you may be right. I may be, look, I've started. You ready for here, Ryan? If you don't mind, I, yeah. it's called, this is a humble brag, I guess. We've started three freshmen a year since I've been to coach here. So if you're a freshman and you want to start, start. Why do I got to tell you? You see, it can be done. It's been done. You ready? 40 players, 40 in my time in Kentucky. And before that, it was the same. Second thing, 50 guys have been drafted. You want to be drafted? Those 50 did it. They're, they're, you know, I saw Nick Saban said, you know, we got $1.7 billion in salaries, and I love Coach Saban. I mean, he and I talk all the time. Not all the time, but I'll call him when I got something I want to ask him. I called him before the NCAA tournament. Didn't help me much. But what I will tell you is ours is $3 billion, and within the next two years, I think it'll be $5 billion in salaries, not endorsement money. Not, are you ready for this? We had about seven or eight play overseas. Not talking about that money. One of them, Dakari Johnson's making three, four million a year in China. So it that's significant money too. I'm not even talking that. So it's been done here, but you got to take what you want. You got to understand everybody's on a different path. So what? It takes you two years. How about this awful thing? It took you three. How about it took you four? You got a college degree. And you're in the end. Tell me. Yeah, but that guy went. He's on a different path. And that's another hard thing. They don't want to. It's it's the microwave. It's got to happen now. Yeah. And then the people around them the same. It's got to happen now. And that's what we fight as coaches. So what's the difference between confidence, which you're saying is important, and say ego, which I imagine is uh, a cancer in a, in a team or in an organization? I'm going to give you something you've probably never heard of. Ego is the enemy. <laughs> I like that. It's a good line. So I call that poison. It's poison. Um, if you want to read the good stuff, then you better read the bad stuff. Like, I don't want to read anything. At my age now, and I never have, I, everybody says he reads any, everything. I don't. Now, the problem is someone else will read it and do what? Tell you, about, tell it. you about it. You know, yeah. and you're like, please don't even tell me. Some of it really good. I don't care. Makes no difference. But the ego part of this is you think I expect and deserve this because of who I am or where I came from or what I've done. It, it just life isn't that way. And fate intervenes at times. Some of it in my life has been so good. I'm like, why? Have, I mean, I wasn't that kind of player. Were you a player, Ryan? No, no. Okay, so, but you're talking to NBA teams and got, you didn't even play. Yeah. But everybody wants to hear what you say. You've been blessed. Yeah, of course. It is intervened in so. different ways. And for me, the same. Well, how about fate intervenes with one of your guys and he gets hurt? And he's got to sit out the year. Well, it happened. Now your your path may be slower, but ego has a way, and pride has a way of coming back and biting you. Sure. And if you recognize it, it's a good thing that it happened. If you don't recognize it, and that means you're going to excuse making, blame everybody. It's not me. It's somebody else. You know what? You're on that path. I say you get on that path from the NBA to the G League, and then to the G League, you pout and you're mad to the YMCA League. Yeah. So confidence is confidence demonstrated performance. So you could be – competent but you get in the game and your confidence is that thick you can't get by a mistake or a missed shot on our team 
guys will tell you, I take them out for not shooting. But do you know why they don't shoot? They don't want to miss. Because they miss two in a row. Right. Now I'm going to pass up an open shot and drive it and charge or turn it over. Boom, you're out. Why didn't you shoot the ball? Shoot the ball. You're not even in games. The ball goes to a guy before he catches it. Shoot it. Shoot it. Like, that means your confidence is like this. And what happens is other coaches are going to go through what I've been going through because of this transfer portal. Yeah. New teams. You're coaching new teams every year. And you know what? That's what makes – how do you help them help themselves? Because if you're trying to do it for them, it's not deep enough. It's that deep. I think the, the, the tricky thing about ego is that it's often based on external stuff, right? That you're doing well, that people love you, that, they're, that they like you. And then what happens when, you know, the shots don't fall your direction, when you're not getting the playing time, when somebody says something mean about you, then you internalize that too. So you feel like a piece of crap because you're playing like crap and you don't want that either. Right. And, and what I would tell you, um, when you're dealing, they got to They got to feel their feelings. Sure. Okay. But they also got to recognize what's causing me to feel this way, but you got to feel like that last game. I wanted them to hurt, to grieve. I mean, there's nothing more important to me than having this program be the gold standard, that every year we have a chance. This is the first year one of my teams in my career has lost that double seed kind of game, that double-digit seed. And we all I had to deal with it. And so you want them to feel the pain of it so you don't want to feel that way again. Sure. But the ego part of, I call it your delusional. You, the delusion of... Everybody loves me. This will never end. Sure. And being humble yet hungry. Be humble about it, but be hungry as heck. And and trying to get guys in a frame of mind where when they leave me, they can be one, great teammates. Pat Riley said the greatest compliment of your players in your league, in our league, they're all great teammates. And I look around the league, and that's I'm proud of that. They learn that stuff here. Um, but the other side of it is, you know, you get carried away. Believe me, the basketball gods will bite you. Be humble, yet be hungry. Well, you know, being a good teammate, it, the Stoics talk about, they say that the chief task in life is like, what do I control versus what I don't control? And you kind of always can, you don't control how tall you are. You don't control how much playing time you get, but you do control whether you're a good teammate or not, right? Like that is up to you always. And I think we often get distracted by these sort of things that are not in our control at the expense of things that are in our control, which ultimately I think make a, a bigger difference over the long term. You know, I, I agree, but I would say the simple part of it is if I care more about these guys than myself, and we all are in that mode, we're about each other, your team's going to be better than the pieces. Sure. If everybody is about themselves, you can't be a good teammate. I don't care however you want to say it. You got you have to be about the other guy and his success. And his success can't, like, bother you. Like, you're, you're joyful with his success. And the best teams I've had, that's how they've been. That makes sense to me. How, how do you think about culture in an organization where you don't have the continuity that, you know, you might if everyone was there for, for four years or, or however long? How do you think about keeping a consistency and a culture when the pieces are rotating uh, more than they might have rotated in the past? Well, the first part of that is how you recruit. So if you're promising the world to everybody, um, it's hard to really have standards in a culture. If you're making it clear that this is the hardest thing you'll ever undertake and it's not for everybody, every game you play is a Super Bowl. Every player you play against wanted your scholarship. He wanted to be here. 
are you ready to come to practice every day because you're ready for this, Ryan? NBA scouts are in our practice. You're being evaluated every day. Are you ready for that? Well, I like to take a couple days a week off. Well, then your evaluation is, is he this guy or is he that guy? Who is he? I don't know who he is. I've seen him unbelievable. I've seen him so bad he's not good enough to play in our league. Are you ready for all that or you want to hide? There are no cracks to hide in here. So when you talk about it, it's holding them to a standard. If you don't guard here, it's hard for you to play. you got to be able to guard somebody. We slipped at the end of last year, not offensively. Our offense was as good as anybody in the country. We had made adjustments from one year to the next. We did things different. We were scoring third in efficiency in offense. Defensively, we slipped the last five games. And if you guard well enough, they can't score enough to beat you. Sure. And that's what slipped. Well, you got to have a standard. The other thing is, have you ever coached a new team before? Now, I'm just telling you with this transfer stuff, every one of us are going to have new teams every year. Yeah. That's what it's going to be. And it means like, okay, I don't have four years. Now, I'll be honest, I had veteran players. This is one of my oldest teams, and I love coaching them. When I was at UMass, I coached everybody for four years except Marcus Camby. Coached him for three. When I went to Memphis, Dewan Wagner was my first, quote, one and done. And I had a couple one and dones, but I also had guys that stayed three and four years. Now it became you're here one or two years, a couple guys, three years, four. And it's now, though, you got teams that lost their whole roster. Like everybody left. New coach comes in or the same coach is there. He's got all new guys. How do you do this now? What are the principles? We're going to play fast. We're going to be unselfish. We're going to have five guys in double figures. Well, I want to score 30. All right, maybe we can score 120 a game. I don't think so. So you're going to have to score. The most anybody scores is 20. And then from there it goes down, five to six guys. What are the principles you go by? Ryan, I got to ask you, how in the world did we have six guys drafted from two different teams? How would that happen? I don't know. How does it happen? You got everybody shared. Sure. And the little six, all six had scored 25 in a game, at least once. So everybody showed. Everybody wins. And you're being evaluated different here. Numbers don't matter. You ready for this statement? Every team has a leading score, even the one that's 1 in 26. So you could score nine points a game here and be a lottery pick. So number you could play 21 minutes a game. You ready? And be the number one pick in the draft, Carl Towns. You could come off the bench and be an all-star, Devin Booker. So is it ego? Ego is the enemy. Yeah. Is it ego that you're playing for minutes and shots and – Fame and this, are you playing to get better? Are you playing to fight? Are you playing to learn to be a great teammate? If a player never fails, I'm afraid of that. Sure. How's he going to react when he does? I want players to struggle some and have to fight through adversity because they learn about themselves. I want to watch a player play. You ready? When I evaluate, I want to see a bad game. How is he to the coaches, to his teammates, to the officials? That tells me more than anything because you know what? At Kentucky, you don't have an easy game and you're going to play bad a couple times. We can't fall to pieces. We can't break up as a team because you're not playing well. Because there are going to be games you're not playing well. So those are what makes it a little bit different here. Yeah, I remember I talked to John Snyder, who's the the GM of the Seahawks, and he was saying that he, he doesn't like draft picks who haven't been through some form of adversity and then recovered from it because he's like, look, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, right? So we don't want it to be the first hard thing that you've ever done in your life, right? Like adjusting to life in the NFL is going to be extremely difficult. 
So if you have no experience overcoming difficulty or bouncing back from a bad game or a bad practice or a bad season, you're not going to, you're not going to, that, that learning curve will kill you. So I, I could, I could see why you would want to look for people that ha, have demonstrated the ability to bounce back from stuff. And they have a bad game. Yeah. So what? how do they respond to everybody around them? They didn't play well. They took the shots or the play that lost the game. Well, they take responsibility. What I try to do here, if we lose, I will always take on the responsibility. The reason I'm doing it, even if it's not, and everybody knows, wow, you couldn't have shot the free throws. or you. Some people believe you. Like, yeah, he's right. He stinks. He can't coach. You know, you'll get that too. But the reality of it is it's a teaching tool for me. Yeah, there are times that it was me. There are times that it wasn't, but I'll say it was me. Sure. I want them to learn it's okay to say I didn't do well and I cost us a game. It's okay. And and if a young man, they lose and he tries to blame everybody else or the family says, yeah, all these guys. And I'm like, no, dude, it was you. You missed the shot. You made the play. Um, the other guy is they take it too hard. I watched a, a state final game where the best player on the court missed a game-winning shot. And I know how hard he took it. I said, use it as fuel. Fuel. No. The next time you get it, you can't wait. I asked Sam Cassell. Sam played for me when I was coaching the Nets. And by the way, I don't know if you know, Ryan, the Nets fired me. Just yeah, I've heard this. Put that yeah. out there. But we went to the playoffs, and I looked at Sam, and he did stuff late in games that I was crazy. I couldn't believe. And I said, Sam, you've made more game-winning shots. How do you? What's your mentality? You ready? I'm not afraid to miss the game-winning shot. So now, how many guys in that league of 450 aren't afraid to miss the game-winning shot? A handful. Michael says, I know you saw all my makes, but let me show you the games where I missed a game winner or missed that shot. But that's fine. I'm not afraid to miss it. That mentality, that mental toughness, that being in that zone that I'm good and the thought of missing never enters my mind. I try to tell these guys, I tried to talk to them that last game, play to win. Quit worrying about losing. Just play to win. We'll know whether we won or lost here in a few minutes. Play to win. But when a kid's 18 and 19, it's easy for me to say that. When I've coached a 1,000 games, maybe more than a 1,000, something like that, that I've coached so many games that I know how this is. Just play to win. We'll see. We'll know where it's going. Yeah, it, it, that to me is what confidence is, the ability to take a shot having missed that shot before and being okay with the outcome, whether it goes in or not. Just being uh, a strong enough sense of self that you're like, I can ride this out, whether they carry me off in celebration or they boo me off the court. I'm me and I'm comfortable being me, whatever anyone else outside me thinks. How long does it take a player to get to that? It's hard. It's hard. And you got you got to have some success, too, I think, to realize, oh, it's not as magical as you think it is either. Right. You're just like win, lose. It's life. You know, like I think when my first book hits number one on The New York Times bestseller list, it, the anticlimacticness of it also freed me up to take more risks in the future because I'm like, either way, it's you're, you still wake up and you're you. You know, it's still life. I, I get it. I'll throw this to you the same way. We won the national title in 2012. The game ends. My wife is up on the stage with me. I said, well, we're done with that. Now let's get on with business. Yeah. I mean, it literally did not, you know, it, it, the, the, We've won more games in the 13 year, more NCAA tournament. I can go on and on. But because I'm about kids and because it's about development, people say he doesn't care about winning. And anybody that knows me thinks that is so hysterical. That means there's something else bothering you about what I do. 
So yeah. you're going to your go-to, which he doesn't care about winning. And a lot of times it's these kids shouldn't leave. They should be at this school for four years. And then my point is, what about your son that could leave and become, you know, make a half billion dollars after one? Well, that's different. That's my son. Everybody else's son should stay in school four years. So it might be he should have all Kentucky players. So he didn't care about winning. He just wants to help kids, and he wants kids to be drafted and all this. Well, the truth be told, I went from the business of basketball to the business of helping families. My life became way easier. We won way more games. We went to four Final Fours in five years, only been done by a handful of guys. We could have won a couple more national titles. Probably the team was too young. One of them had started five freshmen. But I accepted it because I felt good about what I was doing and how I was doing it. But that national championship made it so that they couldn't say, well, he'll never win a national. Nah, I can't say that. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll never write a bestseller. He yeah, wrote one already. But when you go through this stuff where, where you're analyzed and you're, you look at it and say, I got to be comfortable in my skin. Not only them, if they know I'm comfortable in my skin, it's a little easier for them to be comfortable in their skin. Yeah, I, um, I, I relate to the sort of one and done, two and done players because I left college after two years to be a writer. And there were people that told me I was throwing my future away, that it wasn't going to work out. But, you know, if you love what if you have a chance to go do the thing you're going to college for uh, to go be a pro at what you do. It seems insane that for somebody else's peace of mind or somebody else's standards, you're going to you're going to you're going to stay away from that thing, especially in a life that's so unpredictable where you could get hurt. The market could change. I mean, it, it's it's in, it's insane what people expect uh, these kids to do. But that's why they'll say he doesn't care about winning because there have been players who have been top 10 picks that say to me, what do you think? And I say, if you want to do what's right for me and my family, why don't you stay? If you want to do what's right for you and your family, you probably should go. You're a top 10 pick. What are you going to be? Move three spots, four, go. Um, but the other side of it is a young man who may not be a first round or second round pick. As you know, I'll give you the numbers. 85% of the second round picks don't make it. You know what their average length of career is if you're a second round pick? No, much shorter. Games. 100 wow. games. So two That's seasons, a, maybe? Maybe, well, no, 100, well, maybe two seasons because you're playing 30 games. Yeah, right. You're not playing much. Um, that's a fact. That's a number. When the NBA says they project you as a second round pick, the direct NBA that comes to you with their evaluation, they're right 97% of the time. So if anybody tells you you're going to be a lottery pick and they picked you to be undrafted, they're lying. They're lying. So, but some kids want to go anyway, Ryan. You know what I say? It's your life. Sure. I don't think you should go. And here's why. But I'm with you. And then I worked to get that guy in the first round. And I've done it three or four times where those guys went late first round. But they had short careers which was their choice, and they knew they got the right information. And I, I just want to know, when I look in the mirror, I feel good that I'm not using somebody's child. I'm not. I'm that goes back to trust you were talking about, what kind of promises you make. I, I feel like when I hire someone, especially like people who, who want to be writers, I'm like, what do you want to do? Where do you want to end up? Because you're not going to work for me for the next 30 years. This isn't GM. Right. So if you can tell me where you want to end up, we can be honest with each other about how we can help each other get there. I, I want to get something out of you, but I promise you, you will get more out of me if we're clear on where you want to end up. But if we're lying to each other, we pretend this is a family, you know, or we pretend that that this is all forever. You know, we're not being honest and probably both of us are going to end up feeling disappointed or exploited. Who do you think are our best ambassadors? The players who succeeded in the program, whatever that definition not is. Just, not just succeeded now, like for basketball. Some of them went on to other walks of life. Sure. But how they were treated, 
they're our biggest ambassadors. And let me say this. A lot of times, the guys that weren't the stars appreciate it more than the stars. Because sometimes the stars think, you didn't do anything for me. I only did for you. And not, I've had great guys, believe me. Yeah. My best players have been great guys, which has made my job easy. Think about your best player being a jerk. Right. And he's by far your best. And he, what, what kind of team do you have? How much fun is that every day? How sure. about walking in and he thinks, well, I, I, I've never had that. Never. But you do have guys that appreciate it more than others. Sure. And I'm trying to say, my guys, whether I'm talking to Derek Rose from back in the day or Marcus Camby, the conversation doesn't end with, do you know how much I appreciate what you did for me and my family? I'm saying it. Sure. And I love you because you have always been. And, and it, then it comes back the other way. Coach, stop. You know, I mean, but that's how it's supposed to be. Right. And what you said is so true. I imagine the people that have worked under you, that everybody had the idea, this is what we, where we are, why we're here, and here's what we're all trying to do. You're just, if they want to leave you, you're like, I'll help you. Where are you trying to go? I'll make the call. And right. for the rest of their lives, they're with you. They're your, they're your ambassadors out there. When You worked for who? How is he? What, is he a good guy? Right. Like I love reading his books, but is he, is that really him? Or, and now all of a sudden, you know, you get where you're looking around, like stuff is coming at you and positive things. And it's from your ambassadors. You try to do it with staff. You try to do it with players. You, you know, you're trying to, I've always said this. If I'm doing what I'm supposed to, I want a thousand people in my orbit to say without me, they say this, without me, none of this gets done. A thousand. I want more. I don't care. And there could be some that take the credit. Without me, it doesn't get done. But now we brought a bunch of people in. And they're all with the same mindset. And they know what we're trying to do. Here at Kentucky, it's we want to compete and win national titles. First thing is you got to be in the hunt every year. Yeah. Now, if someone was going to win nine or ten in a row, like sometimes our fans think we should, and I'm fine with that. I love our fans. But that would be John Wooden back in the 70s when you played four games. Yeah. And he deserved to win them. He was better than everybody. In my mind, the best coach maybe in any sport ever. That's my mind. Probably, yeah. But that being up at bat is what this is about. Yeah. Do you are you able every year to have your team in the hunt to win it? Sometimes Virginia 16 beats a one. 15 beats a two. Us, Duke, Syracuse. Tommy Izzo called me right after the game, said that happened to me. A 15 beat us. I was a two. Stuff happens. But are you up at bat? And that's what you do when players trust you and they know you care about them. And at the end of the day, you'll do right by them. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've gotten to know R.C. Buford here a, a bit in Texas. And uh, I, I remember he had me to a game and I was taking the elevator up to his suite. And I noticed that the, the elevator operator had a championship ring on. And I said, whoa, where'd you get that? And they said, oh, when the Spurs win, everybody gets a ring. Like everybody in the whole organization gets a ring. And I think that's the same idea to, to be in contention every year to have a culture. It's not just who's on the court, like who the star player is, but does everyone feel like they're part of something that's going places that has a set of standards? And then also are there rewards if you get there? Uh, to me, that's what a winning culture looks like. And, and I've said this for years and years. Coaches win basketball games. Administrations win championships. Yeah. That means everybody's involved. Everybody from top to bottom is buying in. If you don't have the facilities you need, administration's not bought in. They're just not. If you don't have what it takes to win a championship and you are at the lowest end of the totem pole in your league, no, we're not trying to win a championship. We're just playing a season. Coaches will win games. You want to win championships, that's administrations. 
Yeah, I've been amazed too. To, to I think people don't understand the degree to which the coach is over is the CEO of an enormous admin, uh, you know, an enormous organization. But then there's also the board of directors above them and investors, and it it is this enormous organism, and you have to be able to manage not just down but also up. Right. And I think that that is a skill not a lot of people have the ability to manage up to get buy in from those people who have a million other things going on. Uh, that's probably just as hard as figuring out what calls to play. Yeah, it's it's um, um, having everyone bought in. Of how we're going to do this, what we do, and then doing what you say. I remember I'm at UMass and. Back in the day, they had this Prop 48 thing. It was so unfair and racial in every way, and you could only get on a campus, and, and, and we'd let you get on campus, but you're a Prop 48. You can't play. It was just a bad connotation. And the university had never taken a Prop 48. And I said, if I take this kid and he does not graduate, I'm fine. Don't let me do it again. But if this kid comes in and he's doing his work and you look and say, wow, well, we ended up having five Prop 48s that all graduated, which showed you the rule wasn't right, but it also showed the university they could trust what we were saying. It was more than just basketball. Here, we give out lifetime scholarships. So if you come here and you leave, as long as you leave in good academic standing, you get a lifetime scholarship. And we had guys, yeah, we have guys coming back from John Wall, um, Dakari Johnson, Julius Randle. I'm not talking like, well, he didn't make it. No, these guys are coming back, chipping away. Um, Some of them left in two years. Some of them in three. Guys have come back to get degrees. So the school knows, wow, everybody leaves our program in good academic standing. So they did what they were supposed to. They didn't just come here and play basketball. And eight or nine of them have already started their way back. We've graduated 24 out of 24 in my 13 years or 25 out of 25 that did not either finish their time here um, or graduated. I think five graduated in three years. But they trust that this is – the kids understand you're here to be curious. You're here to learn. If you're curious, you'll be a hell of a player if you have the talent, if you sure. have that base sure. ability. But not being curious, like go back to the room and play video games. And that guy, it's hard to make it. Yeah. You know, you're not going to sacrifice enough, spend enough time. You're not thinking enough. You're not curious enough about where – how about us coaches right now? The game is changing in the last three years. Like crazy. You know I brought in Dribble Drive back in the day. Vance Wahlberg, I went out to a junior college, the whole story. I brought it to college basketball. Then about five years ago, I brought in the positionless. This this thing is, there's not going to be a point guard and you shoot. We're all everything. And now you're looking at this game, and it's even changing from there. Um, where guys would run – actions now some teams are doing everything through one guy and we move off of that other teams are doing things off an action and only creating closeouts and that's what they attack and they play off that closeout that well the, it's changing some guys are doing strictly pick and roll with their guy and we're playing off him i mean if you're not curious you fall behind this stuff. Some of it is I try to read tea leaves. Where is this going? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal, I'm not reading the tea leaves very well. I don't know where this is going right now. I mean, I'm not liking it. I don't like it for the kids, not the NIL money and all that. The transfer portal where you don't have to fight. The minute you smell something you don't like, you leave. I go to another AAU team. I went to three AAU teams and three colleges. Okay, you're going you're gonna to draft that guy. He didn't run at the first sign of trouble or someone did something more for I just don't like it. I don't have the answer to how we control this. I just shouldn't even say control. There is no control. But how we deal with it 
to make it so that it the how about academically? You change three schools. How are you ever going to get a degree? Yeah, that's not a how? recipe for success. Not in academics either. Right. Same right. image and likeness. How do we make it so we're not it's not inducement? We do collectives. So everybody puts their money. Who decides who gets what? If you're in football, it's three years. The kids don't leave for three years. It gets kind of expensive. I mean, you know, it's not just that one. Now you get the next one and the next one. How do you do it through charities? Is money going to charities or the kids? I mean, you got to give 50. I don't have all the answers. I know how we're doing it here to try to make it so that it's a business and a kid and that, and they're out there on, on, on Instagram and other ways that you can get in touch with them. Go through compliance, look at contracts, let them be cleared, and then go. Do what you need to do. But I still don't – I don't know. I mean, I'm here. kids are putting their name in the portal to see what kind of NIL deals are out there. You don't come to Kentucky for NIL, even though we should have the best NIL program because we're Kentucky. Yeah. But you don't come here because of that. You come here for the $3 billion that you get by playing in that league. Right. No, it's nice that name, image, and, but you don't come here. What's name, image, and, what can I make here? What can you make here? Well, Anthony Davis is going to make about $500 million. You want that? Which one? What do you – what? So it's, it's interesting what we're going through. It's the marshmallow test. Do you want to get paid now or later? Right? You want one now or you want two later. That, the, the ability to delay gratification is key. They want both, though, Ryan. They <laughs> want it. I want it now, and I'm going to get it later. And you say, well, I'll give you some. Do you mind me giving you numbers? Go for it. 63% of the scholarship players here get drafted. It's pretty good. What? Pretty good. What's the next level of what you just said? It's ridiculous. If anybody's at 10 or 12%, go there. Go to that school. Of that 63%, 75% go get second contracts. Well, that is ridiculous. That's why you come here. Very hard. Not going to be given to you. You're not promised the world. You're going to be with seven, eight other guys that are just as good as you. It's what it is. But that's why not every kid will come here. I, I need a marshmallow. I need it. I need. I want to do what you're saying, but I don't want to go through that. Yeah. You're making me walk through that stuff. I'm going to walk around, and 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 it's e- a lot easier. But I want to get to the end result. Some have, but not as well as our guys. So what, it sounds like what you're really talking about, though, is the sort of constant need to adjust for change, which is a fact of life, right? That uh, everything is always being reinvented. There's this great expression, we never step in the same river twice, right? Because the river's changing and we're changing. I've got to imagine you do this long enough, it, you could barely even recognize the, the league that you were in at the beginning of your career. So, you know, ego and confidence come into play there because if you expect it to revolve around you and stay the same, you're going to be disappointed. And if you're not confident in your ability to adjust and accommodate and figure out how to win in that new world, it's also going to make quick work of you. I, I would say it, it, in terms of this, you stick with your principles. Everything else changes. Yeah. I mean, I'm just telling you how we play, different things we do. Here's where my issue is. What we're doing defensively, stick with the principles, even though the schemes are different. Right. What are we going to do on offense? There are changes. There are more four out and five out, but the principles stay the same. How fast, how unselfish, five guys in double figures, you know, the star player is going to get – the guy that shoots the best, you won't believe this, gets the most shots. <laughs> I mean, it's not brain surgery. Sure. If you can't shoot, you're not going to sh- take the most shots. So the other side of that is in recruiting. All right, that is beginning to change because of the transfer portal, name, image, and likeness, what are being told to the kids. I try to tell kids, do your homework. Do we need to adjust 
in our approach, even though we still get one of the best classes every year, we've missed on some guys the last three or four years. Did we go after the wrong guys? Did we, you know, we just, I just got to keep evaluating because if you want to succeed, you probably got to change. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Queen of England has an expression that she loves. Uh, if things are going to stay the same, everything's going to have to change, right? And so I think that it's how do you stay at the top so keep your position that means essentially everything has to be up in the air except the principles, the timeless stuff that, uh, that, that can't change. Carl Towns, after he played the first game in Memphis, played great. He rebounded the ball. I saw him grab it. I said – I love that you, you're grabbing balls with two hands rebounding. He said, when I rebound with one hand, I hear your voice. Two hands! Because, you know, that's one of my pet peeves. It's one of my yeah. principles that I'll never change. It doesn't change. And so, but you, it, for me, changing and being ahead of the curve, what's next, how can we be first, has always been what I've lived by, yet – like this year. So we lose that game. Went to overtime. We should have, you know, there's things could have, should have, would have. But if we win the game, there's a good chance we're in the final four. Now with a brand new team, with a veteran team, how many things would you change? There are things and adjustments and tweaks. Um, You should have called a timeout. That last play, when 99% of the coaches would never call a timeout. on the, I just watched uh, Boston win the game with the Nets, where they just – Boston score, or Nets score and Boston takes it, no timeout, run and shoot a lamp and win the game. So right. you most don't. But that all comes into question now because you lost. So you also have to be level-headed. Tommy Amaker and I sitting next to each other in the Final Four – I said, yeah, there's a lot of things I got to adjust. He looked at me and said, hey, you missed free throws. You lose in overtime. They ended up being good. They beat Purdue. They, they were good. And you're trying to change? No. If you were here, you and I would have a different talk we'd be having. So you got to be aware that you can't get caught up in all the stuff that's out there and around you. You just got to say, okay. What's next? My problem is I'm not reading tea leaves on this one. It's I'm a little bit like I'm not sure. Where is it going with because of this stuff? Yeah, but that goes back to your advice to players. It's like shoot the ball. Don't overthink it. Shoot the ball, right? Uh, just because you missed, you know, it Try might have been stuff. a great shot. Might have been a great shot. Was it your book that I read, Fail Fast? No, uh, but I, I, I did write a book called uh, – uh, the obstacle is the way, which is that sometimes I, which I read, which yeah. I read and, and failing fast. I'm telling them early in the year, do things you think you're capable of doing. Let me see it. Yeah. I, uh, just a quick story. So I had uh, Jamal Murray. And when I said that to him, he was going hard left one practice and got tripped and was falling. And before he hit the floor, he flipped it up lefty. Boop. Jamal, are you nuts? You just threw the ball with your left hand. You almost run. I can make that shot. You can't make that shot. He said, Coach, I can make that shot. He is one of the most confident kids that I played. I'm watching him in the bubble when they were playing in the playoffs, and he was unbelievable. Another max contract guy. Went left, tripped, boom, threw one, and it banked in. And I called him after the game, and I said, I can't believe it. He hit me back. I told you I could make that shot. I mean, so failing fast is part of this. And even for me, like I'm literally, I'm a guy that gets going, and if I don't like it, but we're moving in another direction, including offensively, defensively, but also recruiting. If I go see a kid and he was disrespectful to his grandmother or mother, I'm done. Why'd you bring me here? You should have known. You didn't do your homework. You didn't do, you didn't do the background. If he's disrespectful to mom or grandma, you're not respecting us. Right. No way. We're out. So there are times that you make adjustments or I watch a kid play and I go, I can't help him. He is what he is. I don't see anywhere where I can do this and we'll walk away because I do want it to be about both parties. 
Yeah, I'm getting that way with my writing because I work on projects for people and I go, look, here's how I think you should do it. I'm not saying I'm right, but here's how I would do it. And it's the only way I can do it. So we can work together or not. Right. And I think part of confidence is sort of it's not just knowing your strengths and being confident in them, but also knowing your weaknesses, your preferences, where you want to end up and being being able like at the end of the day, it's about making decisions. Can you make decisions and feel good about them and then move on? And live with the results. Yes. If you're doing it from your heart, you're doing it from a well thought out position. Uh, I, Ryan, this was given to me. I'm 29 years old or 28. I just get the UMass job, my first job. You know why I got the job? No one wanted the job. <laughs> they went down the list and I got the job. Yeah. They were the losingest program, fifth losingest of the 80s. You know what that means? Like there's a bunch of college programs for a decade, the fifth losing us. Pat Nardelli was from the town I grew up in, Moon Township, Coriopolis, PA. And he said, Cal, I'm going to give you some advice. He was a businessman in our town, had strip malls and did some different things. And he said, you can have a bad deal with good people. Stuff happens. But you can never have a good deal with bad people. I don't care what it smells like, tastes like, think like, looks like. Don't do it. You walk, whether it's your staff, whether it's players. If you go and interview for a job and you look at this dude and say, not a good guy. But I'll make it a no. Walk, run, sprint, get out. And I've kind of tried to live by that. No, it's uh, there's an ancient expression, character is fate. Right. And so if you get someone with bad character, bad traits, whatever it is, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it works out. Right. Sometimes you get one good, two good winning seasons or, you know, you make a little money with the person. But inevitably it comes it comes back to haunt you. It, it never it's never worth it. it. Short term, maybe long term, never. And you always say, I knew it and I did it anyway. What was I thinking? Mine is a, if my wife says it's a bad idea, it's a it's a hard pass, hard pass, you know, uh, because 100 percent of the time when she's been like, I don't like that person. I don't trust it. It's not a good idea. And I've said, you don't know what you're talking about. Those are the ones I regret. The uh, my wife is a princess like she's the princess. She. Yeah. And, and what I say to her all the time is when I die, I want to come back. My wife. Just tell your <laughs> wife. My wife's different that way. I love it. Coach, this is amazing and a true honor. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to text Rav as we're done. And uh, I can't wait to meet you in person one of these days. Thanks, Ryan. And I read all your stuff. You're, you're good. You're you're helping the world. Um, you're doing God's work when you do the stuff you're doing, because what we all have is this brain is the same. What do you do with it? How do you expand it? How do you make it curious? How do you think different? And all the stuff you're writing and doing, you're helping a lot of people. And the crazy thing, I kind of know who I've helped. You don't even know. I mean, you have no idea. But I bet you you get letters and emails and different things that make you smile. Always. It's the best. That's the ultimate reward, right? Ulti more than success or money. It's like, did you make it? This is what Rav says. Are you making a positive difference in people's lives? That's that's success. And you are. And I'm jealous that you get to help more people than I help. No way. But I'll take the compliment. I appreciate it. I can't wait to see you. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan.